Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to Conversations in the Digital Age. We have a great show for you, if you're a Shakespeare buff, or even if you're not. <laughs> With us is Andrea Chapin. Andrea Chapin has written a dynamite first novel called The Tudor. It's about a period in Shakespeare's life where he has a steamy love affair with a young widow in Lancashire, England. And the book, I can tell you, is something I couldn't put down. It's a blockbuster, and Andrea is going to tell us about it. Andrea, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Uh, now, um, this is your first novel. This is my first so novel. So why would you want to write a first novel about Shakespeare? I... Uh had been in the publishing world for decades at, that, at the point when I conceived of this idea. I had been I, a book doctor, which is a private book editor, for at that point when I started about 10 years, working with many, many first authors on their novels. And I was also regularly reviewing books for Moore magazine. And at this point was on the jury for the New York Public Library Literary Lions Award and Reese would receive every December a big box of, of novels of uh, authors 35 and under to, to rate them. Uh, I had not been doing much of my own fiction writing at that point. Uh, I heard of a book called A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, 1599, by James Shapiro. Actually, at a Thanksgiving dinner in my in-laws, and everyone was talking about it, this wonderful book that focused on one year in, of Shakespeare's life, nonfiction. So your muse was a Thanksgiving dinner with your in-laws? Absolutely. You know, it's true. It's true. And uh, I started, I, 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 I put the book in the back of my head as something I, would want, I want to read. And right before Christmas, I was at a bookstore, and I saw it in paperback, and I bought it. And I said, this is what I'm going to do Christmas Day. I am going to read this book. This is my present to myself. I literally, kid you not, wrapped it up, put it under the Christmas tree, opened it up. Yay, Surprise. thank you, my family. They're like, okay. And uh, started reading it. And it was in James Shapiro's book that I encountered, really for the first time, the idea of these lost years of Shakespeare. And that now, these are lost years where no one knows where he was or what he was doing. No one. And it's much of his life, actually, is, is undocumented. But there's specific years between 1585 and 1592, 1585, when his twins are christen christened, and they have documentation about that. And then in 1592, he appears... So let's, let's just back up for yeah. a moment. He had a wife in Stratford-on-Avon named she Anne Hathaway. Mm -hmm. And he had three children. Mm -hmm. He had twins... Judith and Susanna. Uh, a Hamnet and Hamnet. Judith. Hamnet. Hamnet. Could be twins. Hamlet, but it's Hamnet. Mm -hmm. and Hamnet and Judith. Okay, so Hamnet died early, didn't he? He died when he was about 11 years 11 old. 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So he had three children. Okay, so. He had three children. And a wife in Stratford on Avon. And a wife. He had a wife who was eight years older than he was. Uh, he had a wife who, it, it seems by the documentation, that she was pregnant with their first child when they got married. Oh, wow. Shotgun marriage. Shotgun marriage. Uh, and in 1592, his name, or they believe his name, appears in a, in a sort of sarcastic quip in a penny pamphlet by a playwright and poet named Robert Green. And it, I'll paraphrase it, it talks about who is this guy who thinks he is a Johannes Factotum, who thinks he can do everything who thinks he's the only shock scene in the country. He's a, play, a player's heart wrapped in a tiger's hide. It's a, it's a sort of mean little jab at who is this guy, and they think that shock scene means Shakespeare. So that's 1592. Soon after that, his name does appear in London, uh, and in 1593, his name is on the first book that he ever publishes, or the first piece of writing he ever publishes, called Venus and Adonis, the narrative poem. Okay, well, we're going to get to Venus and Adonis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see how we could uh, miss it. But <laughs> your storyline, first it's set in Lancashire, mm -hmm. in a, in a uh, manor house of a period called Lufenwall. Now, tell us about Lufenwall. Was there a real Lufenwall? Lufenwall, I, I had written, I was almost at the end of writing through the first draft of the novel. I picked Lancashire because it was known to be a territory of, of Catholics in, a, in Protestant 
England, in Queen Elizabeth's England, and there were many recusant Catholics that uh, maintain their Catholicism. Wouldn't take the oath of supremacy. Exactly, like, in a uh, period. St. Thomas More, who was beheaded for mm -hmm. uh, that omission. So uh, they were, it, and um, they often had secret priests that would would carry on masses. Why did you want to them? inject Catholicism in all this? Because it, it was a period rife with religious tension, and I couldn't not inject it into it, basically. And, 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 and there, to go back to Lufenwall, I, I, and then I'll go into the, to, to, the, to Lancashire in that area. Lufenwall, I'd written almost through the first draft of the book, and I had just kept calling in my, in my writing the manor house the hall. And by, by, towards the end, I was, I was, you have to think of a name for this. You have to create a name for this hall. And I was looking at books of manor houses in England and Scotland and Wales. And it hit me right between the eyes that it, of course, should be called Lufenwall Hall, which in truth was the name of uh, a, a Norman-like castle that my great-grandfather built on the Hudson which still exists. You mean Hudson River, New York State, exactly. not in Lancashire. And uh, in a little piece in the New York Times in, the, in 1910, when he was, had bought the property and was building this, it says that he was inspired by his travels in Europe and England to create a Norman-inspired fortress. So, so that's how fiction and fact intermingle. Now, uh, you also visited a manor house in Lancashire called Houghton Tower. Yes. And uh, well, there was some suggestion that Shakespeare may have lived there. It's Houghton Tower, and the, the Ho de Houghton still live there after a thousand years. Sir Bernard de Houghton, the 14th baronet, uh, I interviewed him. He was very helpful, and in, in, he loves family history, and, and uh he was very helpful in, in giving me anecdotes and details. And Did they have a cellar there where they jailed witches? They or, sure did. did. I saw them. I, I, did, were three the, the witches. Bones, bones of three witches were right well, there in the, in the, the cellar? The bones weren't there, but, but at a certain point, uh, they had to bring witches to a trial not far from there, and they had to house them as they were traveling. The caravan was traveling. Did you through. see a cauldron? No cauldron left. No, no eye of newt or toe of frog? <laughs> No, but no, nothing like that. But, but, but you imagined it was there. Well, the very fact that they had to bring riches, witches through there, and that Shakespeare years later writes Macbeth, was was so interesting. But the De Houghton family maintains that they they do have a, a, a will from an Alexander De Houghton, and in that will from the 1580s, they have Alexander De Houghton bequeathing musical instruments to a, a William Shockshraft. So Shakespeare, Shakespeare, it is a possibility because names and words were not consistently spelled that this is William Shakespeare. So there it is. Uh, now, uh, your heroine uh, is called Catherine DeLille, mm -hmm. right? Catherine is like Catherine in Taming of the Shrew. There's an you know, aspect. All these references yes, to, yes. to Shakespeare. There's, now, there's, if she... Uh, is uh, Shakespeare's muse and editor. Mm -hmm. And you were the muse and editor of a number of uh, novelists, isn't that right? That is so, true. So uh, are you Catherine in the book? I, I will, I definitely took what I've done in my life and worked with lots of authors and been their uh, editor, coach, psychiatrist, muse, probably with over 200 authors now at this point in my life. I took that skill as a point of departure for, for Catherine's character and also because it provided resonance for me, the idea of when you get very involved in a piece of work. And I'm known to get very involved and uh, to work with the author in a very close manner that it's... And so Catherine, when I was thinking of who's going to tell the story, when I was seized with the idea of using Shakespeare's Lost Years for a novel and thinking that this was perfect territory for, for fiction, I thought I will make a woman the main character and it will be through her eyes that we see Shakespeare. And then it worked perfectly that I found Venus and Adonis, the first 
piece of writing that ever bore his name, that was ever published, that when it was published in 1593 was a hit. It went into many, uh, many editions during his lifetime. Uh, he, he could have launched and been a court poet from there and, and that would have been that, but he dove back into the theater and we can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, I found a, a, a poem that was so perfect to write a story around because Venus and Adonis is based on the myth Ovid wrote the, about it and, and lots of other literary figures had written about it at that point or it was mentioned in Spencer, it was mentioned in Christopher Marlowe had worked with the same myth. And Christopher Marlowe, now uh, he, didn't he write the plays of Shakespeare? And... <laughs> that's, another whole, that's another whole half an hour. That's no, another novel. No. no, he didn't. Shakespeare wrote <laughs> I'm a the... big believer that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. Didn't Shakespeare write the, the poems and plays of Marlowe? <laughs> that is possible. That is a possibility. <laughs> uh, but uh, Venus and Adonis is a, a very steamy, as you said, very steamy poem. And uh, recently I Particularly was... Particularly for a, a Catholic woman who was uh, conducting a liaison with William Shakespeare. Boy, uh, is this steamy. Well, as, as I will quote... And he's James, married. And he's <laughs> married. I, I will quote James Shapiro as he said, Venus and Adonis was the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey of, of in the 1590s. So, so yes. here you have Adonis, who is a mortal, <laughs> and he's having a love affair with Venus, who's a goddess... Goddess of and love. Goddess of love. And now, I mean, where I come from, men are supposed to pursue women. But Venus pursues Adonis. Well, that's what Shakespeare did. He was known to change things around, and he did that with Venus and Adonis. The, the myth has Venus fall in love with the mortal and try to seduce him. Shakespeare's poem turns Venus into a huntress. It's, it's, there's nothing but Like Diana instead of Venus. It's, she really, she becomes obsessed in a very um, intense uh, way with this mortal and to try to make him love her. And so, And she succeeds, eventually. Not really. He goes, he ultimately goes off before they can finally consummate the, uh, the relationship, uh, he is very coy throughout, sometimes seeming to want to go further with her and then running away from her. And towards the end of the poem, he goes off with his friends to hunt a boar. Have Doesn't a, come back alive. Have a beer with the guys. Exactly. Let's go boar hunting. Let's go boar hunting. <laughs> And uh, the boar stabs him, and so he can't consummate the relationship with Venus. Oh, my but God. But she turns him a... into a flower, so. There it is. There, yeah, that, this is the wonderful thing about myths. There it is. <laughs> well, that is a wonderful thing about myths. Now, uh, it was uh, a time of persecution of Catholics, as, as you've said. Uh, but was there a reason why you wanted to make her and her family a Catholic? When Particularly I was, she's conducting a rather scandalous relationship with Shakespeare. Religion had no bearing on the scandals of the time, in, and, and it probably still doesn't in the sense that they're religions and religious beliefs, but human beings are human beings. And um, uh, it was a very dicey period, religious-wise, and it was also a period where... Um, the arts in the English language and the English in the vernacular was blossoming. It was, it was, a hundred years before you did not have Shakespeare, you did not have Chas, you did not have Spencer, you did not have all these young writers that for, for the first time were writing in the, in the English vernacular. Uh, um, so we have religious strife and I was interested in looking at that and we have a, a country that in something like 50 years had changed the national religion four times. So who can remember what they were seven years ago? And they were serious about their national religion. So you have Bloody Mary who changed it back to Catholicism from Henry VIII, her father, who created the Church of England. And then from Bloody Mary on, you have the, ch the, the, the religion going back to Protestant, back to Queen Elizabeth, who strongly believed well, in it. Queen Elizabeth I kind of presided over uh, all this uh, wonderful theater and yes. poetry that was going on. She wrote on poetry. Period. She wrote There's, poetry. And she can, was a patron of the arts, wasn't yes. she? Yes. She went to the theater and she... She actually went to the theater and then she would have plays put on in court. What people don't 
often don't understand is that the printing press was still relatively, when, when Shakespeare was born, it was less than 100 years old. You have a beginning of writing being published that before and being written that before monks would be writing out Latin in, in manuscripts, but the printing press changed all that. Uh, at, at, at different times during that period, two to three hundred poets would be registered at the national station. The, 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 you had to register if you were a poet to publish something. That was because there was a new blossoming. And it's almost, I, speaking of the digital age and conversations in the digital age, at, it, I, I often think it's akin to what happened with the internet and everyone could be a bloggist and everyone could write and everyone could get their words out there for people to see. It but was, not everyone could be amused for William Shakespeare. And not everyone could be a good writer. And, and that's, so you have... Well, he was good enough. No, 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 I'm talking about everyone else around him right. who was publishing poems for the first time. Well, yes, yeah, he was Francis Bacon and you had Christopher Marlowe, if he wasn't Philip William Sidney. Shakespeare, Philip Sidney. Yes. You had many others. It was a certain environment that... Uh, it was a very treated, rich... Treated writers. Yes. Uh, what people also don't understand is that in the early 1600s at the Bodleian Library, there were, uh, was about 5,000 volumes and about 127 or under 200 were in English. So still prevailing Latin, still prevailing French, Spanish, Italian. So this period that Shakespeare came of age in, in terms of a literary figure, was, was really blossoming. And the English language was leaving the Chaucer and the Beowulf, the Old English behind to create poems and plays in a, in a language that the common man and aristocracy could both enjoy and be entertained by. Now, Venus uh, never consummates her relationship with Adonis. Uh, it gets so close. It gets, gets really steamy. He well, falls back. She's always kissing him. He's always sometimes kissing her, sometimes not kissing her. A lot her. of kissing. A lot of kissing. But doesn't progress much further. But no. uh, in your book, uh, the relationship between Shakespeare and Catherine isn't consummated until page 250-something. Very late. Very late in the game. I mean, yeah. why did you, why'd you wait so long? My, my idea of who Shakespeare was is, or is uh, I, I, I veered from the Shakespeare in love character of Shakespeare, and, and that was my intent from the beginning. He, he is a seducer. A womanizer. A womanizer. He possibly has a little bit of narcissistic personality disorder thrown in. He needs to be worshipped. He needs that from women, possibly from men. Um, oh, so there's a homosexual angle in the whole thing. It hovers. The bisexuality for Shakespeare hovers in my book. There's a, several scenes where uh, it, it, you never fully see it in a scene, but, but I, I suggest it. Uh, and it has been suggested that he was possibly bisexual. If you look at the sonnets and the amazing poems, the love poems to a beautiful young man, it's hard to think maybe he wasn't. You know? Well, he dedicates uh, Venus and Adonis to uh, someone named Earl. Henry Ryothesley, mm -hmm. the Earl of Southampton, mm -hmm. uh, who was his patron, possibly his lover. We don't know, but don't. possibly. And uh, uh, of the 120 love sonnets, a number of them are dedicated to, uh, to this. Uh, Mr. W.H., who could be uh, uh, Henry Ryothesley inverted or could be somebody else. They've just recently, someone speculated that it was actually someone who worked at the printing uh, house. Uh, so maybe it was his proofreader. That's right. Thank God you've corrected my mistakes. Or maybe he inserted <laughs> it. He saw the, the, the sonnets were good. <laughs> exactly. And said, I'm going to take some said, credit for this. Give me a plug. Exactly. Give me a plug. Well, that's, that, that, that's great. But... Uh, so you still haven't answered the question, why did he wait so long, uh, this ardent lover? Yeah, m my feeling is is that he waited so long because he's a complex character and he wanted to um, dangle a possibility of, a, of a, a real relationship in front of this woman who was helping him and encouraging him and indeed almost collaborating with him. And that as the poem winds down, uh, and he knows he might ditch her soon, that's when he consummates it. That's when he does it. <laughs>
exactly. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, and, and then uh, you also have lurking in the background a uh, character who's really drawn from, because they're all drawn from real life, but there was a, a Robert Smithson, mm -hmm. and that's the name you give him in the book. Now, who was Robert Smithson? He's a wonderful character. I was so delighted when I was doing research for this to find just the man I was looking for historically. You found just the man you were looking for. Historically. <laughs> uh, and uh, Robert Smithson was a master mason in the Elizabethan period. He is considered the first architect, the first time they used the word in English to describe someone. They had already used the word in France and in Italy. Um, he was amazing with the creation and design of major homes, uh, major. And he would do everything from designing the intricate mantelpieces or columns or ceilings in stone or plaster work and also design the whole houses. And he was known for really a new type of architecture at that point, which was, they call them lantern houses even. They were rows or ribbons of windows. And the Elizabethan period was a time where the middle class boomed and where people who had not had riches before became richer. And glass is a, um, a symbol of, of your wealth in, in that period. And he built these houses possibly for some new, for what we would say like nouveau riche, but also for nobility, where they had window after window after window, the light comes in. He built a lot of houses in the north of England. When I was looking for someone to play the counterpart for Shakespeare, I found him, and all we know about him is that he had a son who was also an architect, who had a son who was also an architect. So it was perfect for me. We don't know anything about his wife. We don't know anything else about his life. So it was perfect for me to choose him to be not a man of words, or, or a man of the, not a man of the type of words that Shakespeare uses with such ease, but uh, perhaps a man that is solid like the stone that he works in. Uh, works with his hands. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, Shakespeare, uh, being a womanizer, eventually uh, uh, flies the coop and leaves Catherine, this beautiful young widow, to her own devices, and who's left for her? Only someone who works with his hands. <laughs> And uh, yes, so that it was very, very fun to 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 explore. There, there are actually drawings of his in a collection at the V and A in England, and it was Victoria and Albert Museum. Yes, and uh, it was so exciting for me to go spend an afternoon in the special collecting collections, poring over these beautiful, beautiful designs. If they make a movie of the Tudor, um, who'll be the director? Would be the director. Oh gosh, that's such a good question. You're putting me on the spot. Okay, then who'll play <laughs> Catherine? That's well. Let's let's start with Shakespeare. Let's start start with Shakespeare. <laughs> Tom Hiddleston. Tom Hiddleston. Why Tom Hiddleston? He's a wonderful Shakespearean actor, and he has the right look and he has the right edge, and he can play a character who is charming, dashing, and perhaps a little cruel. Uh, so I would definitely, he, he, I, he'd be my first pick for Shakespeare. Uh, Smithson, also interesting, of course, it, I immediately think of Benedict Cumberbatch because he's tall with dark curly hair, or my Smithson is. That's how I've created him. But uh, that would be an interesting choice. Catherine, I've really waffled on, uh, and, and I go back and forth. The editor muse lover of William Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, she's, um, she has to be someone who can play depth. Um, and who, who do you think would be good for her? Ah, well, no, I'm here to ask questions. <laughs> uh, but so I'm going to ask you a question. And my question I'm is... I'm still thinking about Catherine. Andrea Chapin. Who was William Shakespeare? We don't know a lot about Shakespeare. And what we do know about him is that he had a father who was very ambitious. Everyone says, how could William Shakespeare come from, he was, his father was a glover. How could, he, how could he create a son who was 
you know, the king of the, the English language, basically. And if you look at his father, you see a man who married up. He married Mary Arden, who his parents were tenants on her parents' land. She was, she was gentry, and he was of the yeoman status, John Shakespeare, Shakespeare's father. He leaves farming behind, tenant farming behind, goes to Stratford, sets up as a glover, probably an apprentice first. By the time he marries Mary Arden, he has bought two houses. He's known in their documents that refer to this as not just a glover, but someone who deals in money. He so by the, by the I'm end, afraid we've run out of oh time. Oh my God. Okay. So thank you so thank much you. for coming by, <laughs> Andrew Chapin. Thanks. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. For conversations in the digital age, I am Jim Zirin. All the best and be well. Thanks.